Namaste, everyone. From uh, I bring the namaste from the Himalayan Kingdom. Just let me. Yeah. Uh, so I'm sure uh, I see a lot of smiles, and I think this conference should start with a good smile. And it's important for us to. I think everyone who did write a, a note uh, and are here have uh, that element besides architecture. I think in order to live a life, you got to be happy and you got to have some contentment and you got to be physically balanced. So I would like to share, uh, I'd, I'd, as soon as I heard the topic, I wrote uh, three paragraphs because I felt so strongly about it after having come uh, uh, so long with, with my career and uh, whatever I've been involved with and also doing architecture up in the mountains. I felt that... Uh, Happiness is definitely a state of mind. And, you know, Nepal has been through plenty in the last uh, uh, 15, 20 years. Specifically, we've had, you know, the Royal Massacre where we had the first family removed and then we had a political chaos that kind of went on for almost 15, 20 years. And then the earthquake. But on reflection, I feel that uh, if you look at history of any, any place, people who've suffered the most take it Japan, take it Germany. You know, if they face it with some uh, resilience, they come out much stronger. And I do wish that my country and my people learn from all these experiences. And I would like to show, since uh, we're all architects, most of us are architects, we, we're a little bit more visual in our communication. So I'd like to share uh, some of uh, the images that uh, have, uh, I've uh, experienced myself walking up in the mountains or during the earthquake. So uh, this slide was already played, but Nepal is, uh, for those of you who've been, it's a very colorful place. It's a rainbow of diverse people. We have rich uh, traditions and you know, cultural richness. There's unique art, architecture, cuisine, music, literature. And there is a distinct uh, you know, play of uh, philosophies of Buddhism or Hinduism. For uh, Hinduism, there is the Pashupati Nath, and nearly all our squares within our city, uh, you have uh, some, res uh, some uh, respect for uh, a deity. And if you really uh, kind of look at its uh, you know, deeper meaning, it's really a, dis a respect for nature, you know, whether it's a stone or whether it's a tree. or you know, it's, it's a natural element that people have. People think beyond themselves. And I feel that in life, as soon as you kind of get out of your shell and you start thinking or looking at nature and what, being with nature, you have another experience of life. And uh, my place has uh, got very strong cultural roots. And uh, I would say it's a product of uh, our ancestors. We're very blessed that, uh, you know, for those of you who know, uh, Gautam Buddha was born in, in Nepal. And uh, I was just there last week and in fact in the palace where Buddha stayed for 29 years and there is a western gate in Tulara Court where uh, he decided to leave the palace and maybe explore life. So there are a lot of uh, places in Nepal which are really very reflective places and I think these spaces are very much required in our cities which I feel that it has a very strong functional dimension and economic dimension to it but the cultural interface that is required is somehow diluted as uh, you know, the other priorities come in. So the environment is definitely uh, linked with people, place, and the environment. And for us in Nepal, the mountains are a living a reality where we, it's, it's like the barometer of the Earth's health. Because what happens in cities like uh, in China and in India, it affects the health of the mountains. We see the glaciers, the snow line changing according to the pollution levels that kind of happen, not in our country, but all over the world. So I would say it's a very good barometer for the way the world is functioning. And a place in, in Nepal, because of the strong cultural interface of uh, Buddhism and Hinduism, there are a lot of crafts that evolved, you know, whether it's woodwork or whether it's, sorry, whether it's uh, bronze, brass work, or whether it's tapestry, or uh, yeah, uh, there are lots of craft that has evolved. And our spaces kind of reflect that in, in a certain way, which I will share with you. 
So, uh, Kathmandu Valley, it's, it's, it's a valley where we, ha we have hills all around, and this is an image that was taken in 1950. It has uh, seven World Heritage Sites. Uh, within that small place, uh, you have the Kathmandu, Patan, and Bhaktapur, and two uh, important Hindu temples, Pashupati, Changunara, and the notable ones. The Pashupati is a very sacred uh, place for all the Hindu uh, people, and Changunarayan is our oldest temple. It, uh, this was an image taken by Tony Hagen. A little background of our history. Uh, our country was unified by the Shah King in the 1700. And uh, 1700, sorry, this is the... Uh, and our country was closed till 1950, uh, where the prime minister was more powerful than the king. The king was almost like a puppet. And, but in 1950, the country was opened up, and the, uh, the first UN agency that came to map the geographic survey was Tony Hagen, and he has the UN visa number one. So he came and he walked almost 1,400 kilometers right across Nepal several times and mapped the geographical state. 66 years down the line, uh, Kathmandu Valley looks like this. And uh, this is a reality not just for Kathmandu, but I think it's, it's the population density which we cannot control, you know, but I feel that definitely there is a certain, uh, certain attention towards, uh, you know, the family's structures become much smaller, but still I think everyone wants to be in the center. And specifically in Nepal with uh, the political problem, Everyone wanted to be in, in Kathmandu, and that's when uh, it erupted even more. This is another image by Tony Hagen in 1950, showing the Baudhanath Stupa. And if you can see the scale of things around it, you can see the fertile land, and you can see a structure which had a certain definition. But in 2016, uh, when the earthquake happened, you have all these buildings all around it, but you have a stupa in the middle which you cannot see uh, unless you are inside it. A lit few images to reflect the 2015 earthquake. Uh, this is uh, uh, Bhaktapur, which is a very strong cultural place. There's a lot of uh, earthy materials that make up the place. And there is a very rich cultural life. There have a lot of jatras we call festivals. And the image on the top is when you have the, biscuit, uh, the, the jatra, and you see thousands of people making merry and really coming out to the streets to celebrate. And in 2015, when the earthquake happened, that's the image that we had. But, uh, and this one is the image of the Kastamandap Square, which is right at the heart of Kathmandu. The word Kathmandu is derived from this very temple. And uh, what is so uh, rather paradoxical is that, uh, you know, this structure is supposed to have symbolized the name and unified Kathmandu. But what over the years has happened is that this building was not maintained. It was very important, but right at the center of it, we missed out maintaining this building. And when the earthquake struck, there was a blood camp that was happening. And unfortunately, all the people that were inside it perished. So it's, it's, really, uh, it's really striking at the heart of our cultural you know, uh, thoughts, as well as reality, where we have the, the priority has been to get a political stability. As you all know, in, uh, Nepal's been going through a lot politically. But culturally, in that process, we've lost a lot. And I feel that priorities like we have this discussion definitely should stream into the level of decision makers to understand the place which has an identity could also be restored. So in the earthquake, I think the most valuable space were not the buildings. The most valuable space for us was to run to an open space and see the buildings, what was happening to them. But over the years, like I showed you the image of the valley, uh, we've lost a lot of our precious open space because of uh, the, the development or requirement of the modern society. 
And I feel it was a very, I mean, three days I spent in an open camp in the tent in the army headquarters. And for me, it was a real deep down, you know, questioning of the profession that I was in. We as architects, are we compounding the problem? Or are we looking at ways in which we can mitigate if there is a disaster like this? And the reality of our present governance is, is there everywhere, whether it's garbage, whether it's density, whether it's revolution, it's there for us to see. But we all have dreams, and as architects, we definitely should work with a certain vision. And I feel that for us, it is the historical context, the interface that we have with uh, what uh, you know, we've been blessed with to, uh, to kind of work towards uh, maintaining that character and identity. So uh, I think when we look at our heritage, when we look at where we come from, a lot of time, uh, you know, we think, uh, we, we question whether it's a burden. We don't know whether it's a precious inheritance, but it definitely is our identity. And when we come out and study in, you know, uh, in different uh, places around the world and come back and see what we have, we perhaps understand it as a gift, and also I would like to say that it would be our responsibility as architects, as designers, to value this, because most of the people would be focusing on their daily lives, but we as architects, if you're gonna add value, or are we not adding value to our space? So that should be the deeper question we should ask. So I would like to share a few projects that I feel that were smartly done, and some of them which I was involved with. Uh, the Dwarikas project is an interesting project in Kathmandu where this person who loved walking, and uh, also I like walking, but he used to walk around and he used to notice all these old buildings falling apart. And he started as a hobby that, okay, this building's falling apart, Can, uh, what, what are they doing with all these old windows and artifacts? So they were, they were burning it, they were throwing it, and they were kind of, you know, just uh, wanting something new. So he started this... Uh, uh, collection which kind of, you know, one fine day he had two, three hundred of windows uh, with him, which were of great value, but it of course needed to be restored. So that's the time I was involved with. So we started by making an inventory. And I think in it, whatever you do, first you need to be able to understand the elements that you have, whether it's a three-phase, uh, for us it was the elements that uh, these wooden pieces had. And some of these weigh over a ton in terms of weight. You know, one window weighing a ton. So you can imagine, besides the wood, the thought, the craft that went through it. So we, after doing the inventory, we made a, we studied the three cities and we understood a certain, uh, you know, certain music that they played, whether it was few windows or whether it was uh, an element. And finally, the product that was produced was really an understanding with a background of all that we saw, we kind of uh, took all these pieces and salvaged it into an environment that was very Nepali, which had a certain identity. So I think any dignitary that comes to Nepal, they would love to go and see this place. And I think it's important as architects, as designers, to interface your work with your surrounding. Moving up to the mountains, which uh, I think in Jaipur I miss. I don't see the mountains, but you know, it gives a certain cool feeling immediately. This is the uh, Lukla airstrip, where, uh, you know, as the plane lands and you get fresh air, mind you, when you go higher altitude, you have less ox oxygen, not more oxygen. But the way it works is that when you have less oxygen, your body works much harder to kind of uh, take the little oxygen so your lungs start working fully. And that's how you have all these little children with nice red cheeks. So it's not that you have more oxygen higher in the altitude, but you have to be careful. So the first project we did in this place was a, a small village called Farakpa village, where we incorporated, there was this old building which we had to dismantle, and then we reused all the stone and wood into this little uh, village, or rather it's, a, it's these cottages. So it's all built with local material, with wood, slate, stone, and uh, yeah, all the materials that we could salvage. The second project you see just beside the, the Kwangdi Peak, there is this little thumb, 
we did a resort here because up in the mountains, we feel that everyone should, everything should be traditional. But, you know, you have people coming there, so why not have so certain infrastructure? Sorry, this is just sliding a little fast. So this was the site where you could see the mountains. And uh, you see the Everest, the Nutse, Lotse, Amadablam. And we're really blessed with all these mountains. But we need to understand how to do a little bit that would probably help us stay comfortable. Because if you stay out in the cold, you'll freeze. So how do we create certain infrastructure, whether it's tourism or whether it's hospitals, up there in the mountains? That's very important. Otherwise, we find people leaving the mountains and going towards the cities. So this was a little ambitious project where we had to kind of make 20 rooms. And I feel that projects which are scaled, which are scaled down to match the difficult environment is very important. You should not have you know, a hotel with 300 rooms. I think the set of problems that it brings along would really kind of overshadow the purity of that place. So the people that come here really like very simple space, a clean bed, uh, you know, a little diary that they can write, no television, but just to see the mountains and just get a sense of peace. So this was how the image looks uh, finally at the end. And I feel that, uh, you know, when you are here at this site, I think you, you really don't look at the building too much. You just get overpowered with the mountains and it's, it's a very humbling exercise or rather experience. And I feel that in the city, we, we want to do iconic things, but we don't see the iconic, I would say iconic nature, you know, that is all around us. We miss that. And in Nepal, we have plenty of the iconic natural places, which kind of form the Himalayan range. And I feel that this could be a very strong resemblance or uh, inspiration for us to involve ourselves with. Uh, this is a small project, but I feel uh, I can share this with you because the US Embassy in Nepal uh, decided to build a memorial for their Memorial Day. And they have a set design which is uh, which is, uh, it's a cookie cutter design, the embassy design, depending on the country, whether it's a small country or a medium country or a large country, they just come and place that design. So the ambassador floated a design competition to kind of uh, guide them to do a memorial. So whether we could, we could make a small building or a block, and uh, my thought was, uh, I'd gone to this marble quarry in, in, in Kathmandu, which, uh, I kind of uh, saw the process of taking a huge boulder and slicing it and then, you know, creating marble pieces. So I took that as an inspiration to do this, uh, this little sculpture that as you enter, you see a huge rock, but as you go around it, you really see gaps. And I feel the memorial was a metaphor to this thought that it is very strong, almost like a rock, but it's not there. You see these gaps. So uh, then we were asked to kind of build it and it stays as a piece of sculpture in the garden with uh, three words from a poetry that I had written about remembrance, recollection, and respect. And I feel architecture has that opportunity for us to make people stop and think and make them, in the process of thinking, make them a better person. It's not just architecture. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of living. So it was, it was really a, a, a good, a good feeling to have this little sculpture inside the embassy because the ambassador wrote to us saying that in the evening when everyone returned back to their work, they kind of looked at this piece and felt uplifted and went away. Uh, presently, I'm working on this site. And uh, what could be more majestic than to be in a place which almost looks like a painting where uh, there is a settlement, there is... There is a river that winds through. It's almost like uh, you know a letter you wrote home when you were small. You drew the mountains, you drew a river, you have sunrise. And I, I received this client who came to me saying that, uh, let me give you a little background of this project because it's important. Uh, this is the Manang Valley. And it's a very beautiful place, but very remote. And our late king, King Mahindra, he came on a helicopter here and he landed on this place and he saw the place and he saw the people and he found it, he found the people very, uh, uh, you know, 
cut off. So he gave them special privileges to, uh, to do trade. But unfortunately, what happened was that a lot of them left the place and came to Kathmandu and did trading in Hong Kong. So there were a lot of abandoned houses. So this client came to me and said that, why not uh, do something in his birthplace? And that's how the project began. So this is the settlement that is there, which has a certain vocabulary that exists. And I feel that it is very different to the vocabulary that exists in, in, in the city where you're trying to stand out. It's, it's more community driven, it's more sharing of resources, sharing of light, and sharing the direction that you stay in. So I'll just wind up with a few more slides. That uh, I feel that being smart is really, it's, it's about your priorities in life. You know, where you want to spend your precious energy. And you got to get a feel of the spirit of the place. These are a few images of the project. And this is how it's evolving at the moment. But when you see this uh, buckwheat, vegetables, berries, it reminds me that in this place, what is so interesting is that the fertile land beside the river has been left for farming, and people have built in very difficult places. Whereas in the cities, we built all around uh, the river, and the river is a neglected place. So finally, at the end, I would say um, the health and happiness of a human body is very much related to, to the way a city functions. If you balance your energy centers with a little background of the holistic living, your city can be healthy also. If you have a heart which is clogged up, you know, whether it's, I would say it's your river or your water line or your air, you would have a city also struggling to kind of grasp for air. And a uh, few images to just share with you. When I go up, I practice yoga. And I have to share this with you because earlier I used to wear glasses, which I was just sharing. But after wo working in these mountains, I've stopped wearing glasses. And I feel that as you align and tune the energy centers within your body, mind, and spirit, an architecture and engineering blueprint of your latent potential will emerge. And that's the same for your city also. If you put your priorities, uh, correct, you will start getting the spirit of the place. So these are certain contexts of sharing, yet with a sense of privacy, a certain openness reflecting to our mo uh, modernity, and also the courage to remove the inessential. And I think the earthquake has been a big lesson to us to really reevaluate what is essential, what is, uh, you know, what is non-essential, and how to kind of maintain these heritage that we have. So definitely a sense of place is very important and uh, it should reflect your, your identity and the inheritance from our cultural, wherever you are, it forms a background to really interface your projects and design with. So I would like to stress on the word identity and I would like everyone to look at it as a precious inheritance and a trusted responsibility. So this is a final slide, just a couple of days back before I left Manang, I saw this child playing in, in, in this open field. And I feel the most valuable space that we can give our children for happiness is really the open space. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Saroj. That was very, very refreshing. Uh, our next speaker today is Mr. Jitendra Mehta. I had the privilege of uh, meeting him yesterday evening in his quite a ball of energy. And uh, so he graduated in 93. Uh, uh, he was a university topper. And his uh, firm is the only consultants to have four major selections of proposals prepared by them under smart cities mission competition amongst the 98 aspiring cities of India. Uh, Jabalpur and Indore in top 20 of the first round, Ujjain and Gwalior being the top 10 of the second round. Uh, Mr. Jitain Mehta is a uh, recipient of various national level and other prestigious awards for many of his outstanding projects, which include, among others, J.K. Simmons Architect of the Year Silver Jubilee Award in 2015, uh, IA Excellence in Architecture Award 2011, Hoodco Design Award, and I think the list is very long, probably I'll consume the 20 minutes if I were to read the whole of it. So now I really would like to invite Mr. Jitain Mehta for his presentation. Thank you. Yeah. It's a privilege for me to be here on the prestigious forum of Arcasia last almost 30 days we were 
in a different mode, chatting, discussing with Mukul, Gyaninder, Tushar, and the entire team of Rajasthan about organizing this event. And then I got this opportunity to talk something about smart city. The mandate given to me is 20 minutes that I have to complete because my friend Dhruv is sitting with a bell over there. So I thought maybe I'll come up with a presentation and I'll try to make it in 18 or 19 minutes precisely. Second, taking it up further, what Sarosh has told, it was really inspiring. Of course, not the yoga which he has done and shown in the photographs. <laughs> that was a bit difficult. But uh, continuing the same spirit, I'm presenting proposal of a smart city in Dor, which was selected in the round one. And it came 11th in the list. And we were also very much lucky that being resident of Indor, we got the opportunity to do something for our city also. So it is a video presentation and uh, I'll request somebody to, if they can play the presentation. Although the archaeologists have claimed to trace the origin of settlement to some 4,000 years back to the days of Indus Valley civilization, yet the history gives a hint of Indore as a city of comparatively modern date founded and developed by local landlord Rao Nanlal Chaudhary from 1650 to 1741, later taken over by Maratha warriors, the Holkers. Indur was a small village on the confluence of beautiful rivers Khan and Saraswati, situated on one of India's oldest pilgrimage routes from Mahakal at Ujjain on River Shipra to Omkareshwar on the River Namada and onwards to Rameshwaram. Indur was on the route of Marathas of Deccan on their way to North India. It was a military camping site strategically located amidst the two political power centers of that era, Pune, the capital seat of Peshwas and Agra of Mughals, Shabe Malwa. The pleasant climate, fresh air and life-giving rivers attracted the Holkers to eventually make Indur their capital. Drawn by the promise of lucrative trade, the camps of Marathas and capital city of Holkers, the traders from Rajasthan, Gujarat and Maharashtra, settle in for business opportunities in the region. Holkers developed Indore and started constructing Rajwara with its epic center. The city took its natural sprawl following the needs and necessities as required time to time. It was the visionary ambitions of Holkers who engaged Sir Patrick Geddes to develop the master plan of Indore, who stayed in Indore for a period of two years during plan preparation. During the Raj rule, Indore became popular across country as a hub of trade and commerce with distinct market segments for distinct commodities, especially one of the largest textile centers in Asia. During the pre-independence, the traders and entrepreneurs who began their small businesses centuries back could create a considerable buyer's base over time adding to the economic development of the city. Post-independence, Indore continued the patterns of life that were established by the trader community. And urbanism created lots of pressure on the central core around Rajwara, known for the distinct trade and commerce opportunities, resulting in dilapidation of urban infrastructure till the date. Amidst the burdens of this rapidly growing city, Rajwara and surrounding suburbs remained the cultural, social, economic and political pivots of the city.
Indore along with 20 other cities has been selected as winner of Smart City Challenge competition under central government's flagship program Smart City Mission First Phase. Indore is the city that has completed historical and remarkable journey from Holkar dynasty to become vibrant commercial capital of Madhya Pradesh, the heart of India. Apart from being a center for trade and industries, Indore is swiftly emerging as educational and medical hub. In the process of preparation of smart city proposal, Indore has carried out one of the widest and hugest citizen engagement program which has shaped the vision, goals and strategies, selection and planning of EBD and Pan City proposal. Close to 6 lakhs interaction were achieved through various offline and online mediums such as MyGOV, Indoor Smart City website, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, WhatsApp etc. to have diverse viewpoints and ideas. Indoor Vision this large city engagement program brought in the conception of a world-class smart city which based on these five eyes Innovation, Inheritance, Inclusion, Incubation and Investment Rejuvenation and Innovation in Special Restructuring of Urban Form Sustainable Urban Mobility, Environment and Infrastructure Inheritance of rich cultural and economic heritage Inclusive urban governance and citizen services for better lifestyle Incubation of the urban workforce Enabling Indore to be a destination for investment On basis of suggestions, opinions and ideas received from local public CBD area Rajwara and adjacent areas which is in the center of this rapid growing city have been selected for the area based development. The smart city proposal will be implemented in two parts area based development proposal and pan city initiative proposal. 742 acres of area around Rajwara has been selected as a pilot smart city area for development. Under this proposed plans are Inclusion of well-planned traffic system and metro for urban transportation Riverfront development Two-way street One-way street No vehicle zone Parking zones Revitalization of the urban form of Rajwara area and transforming it into a vibrant center of business while cherishing and conservating its integrity as a historical, social and cultural center. The proposed no vehicle zone will be supported by ample parking spaces along with incorporation of incubation centers. Conservation of heritage and heritage street development for heritage walk is one of the initiatives. Apart from making these heritage streets no vehicle zone, construction of plazas and avenues for the citizens will be the key attraction of this proposal. Restoration of traditional bazaars with its historical form by facade treatment which will impart sustainable mobility to footfall in these traditional markets and streets. Shifting of the web of overhead power lines to underground in traditional eateries, gold and silver jewelry shops, cloth and ready-made garment shops, as well as water supply, sewerage, OFC lines and other vital utility services will also be underground by utility ducting, through which footfall and approachability in the area will be easier and narrowness of the roads will be decreased. With such initiatives, economy of these traditional business centers will be revived. 
smart street lighting and lighting of public open spaces will be conducted by solar energy. Gradual widening will take place by taking setback of existing streets and roads with the help of unification of plots, extra FAR planning norms, etc. The private properties in the area will be incentivized to go for the redevelopment through additional FAR over existing FAR. All the redevelopment buildings will have grid connected rooftop small solar power plants and use of same will be incentivized and promoted in the private properties. It is also proposed to revitalize the rivers through riverfront development which will open up the riverfront as development of promenades and healthy environment to bring citizens closer to their natural heritage. These heritage ghats are proposed to be restored and the lining of river will carve out usable public open spaces. CP Shekhar Nagar slum, which was situated in the midst of city for last 40 years, has been shifted to newly constructed homes recently. And development work of this area that comes in smart city is commenced in the form of riverfront development and green beautification under Amrut plan. The water supply and sewerage proposal in the area will be integrated to allow reuse of recycled wastewater through dual piping system. Redevelopment of MOG lines, slums and public land is proposed to be carried out on transit-oriented development principles. These areas will be developed as mixed-use, high-density and walkable communities that has improved pedestrian safety. In the Pan City Initiative, Indore has proposed an Indore Intelligent City Management System with two sub-components. First, Smart Solid Waste Management. Second, Intelligent Transport System. The Pan City proposal will have a central command and control center along with a common multi-purpose backbone communication network and remote sensor network to acquire key data related to transport and waste management. These sensors will include cameras, traffic signals, sensor devices installed at traffic junctions on public transport vehicles and waste management vehicles, etc. The smart solid waste management will also use same command and control center and communication network for monitoring of waste collection, transportation and disposal of solid waste. Waste to energy mode of disposal is proposed to be used for treatment and disposal of solid waste. Intelligent transport system will have traffic management through adaptive signal coordination and control, traffic surveillance and monitoring through command and control center. Other features of ITS are public transport management, parking management and electronic payment system. Convergence of various plans has been taken in this proposal.
questions. Thank you. There were a lot of, uh, I'll just like to conclude. There were a lot of uh, discussions regarding the executions of the plans. But I think full credit to the residents of Indore, the governance, the various professional organizations working in Indore, that we were able to, three years back, Indore was ranked as around 150th position in the clean desk survey. Recently, just in last month, we were number one. Probably while making this SCP also, it was the willpower of the people. They were actually, see, this is a very important thing because when it comes to smart city, a lot of architects I frequently interact with, they say it is something IT, something this thing. It is not that exactly. It is a total, total integrating, very integrated proposals in which each and every aspect is well covered. Of course, without IT, without our smartphone, I mean, thinking future ahead, it's not possible. We need to have. But it was misinterpreted in that way. And as Sarosh has pointed out in his presentation, which was the heart. Rajwada is the heart of Indore, which unfortunately, and over the last, I think, 15, 17 years or more than that, has lost its identity. But we took this as smart city challenge selection of area as an opportunity to basically restructure it, rejuvenate it. And that's how, and I am sure, with the way we have worked in uh, Swachhata mission, I'm sure smart city execution of Indore will also win Lawrence. Thank you very much.